morning all hope you're all well um and fingers crossed we'll be able to as sophie said do a few more of these events in person and we can actually uh, see and hear the night jars uh, from the field as it were rather than from the screen but um given they're a uh, crepuscular slash nocturnal bird and it's uh, just gone 10 in the morning this is no bad way to uh, to give everyone a glimpse into the uh, mysterious life of the night jar so Without further ado, I will start sharing my screen. Um, and the internet here at the farm is at best uh, steady. So uh, if there is a slight pause or a delay in buffering, then, uh, then please bear with me on that one. So welcome and thank you for attending this coffee morning about uh, the life of the night jar. Um, the opening slide that we've got here is just a very, a very straightforward picture of uh, a bird during the daytime or probably coming up to, to the start of the evening, looking at the light levels. Um, nesting on the ground, um, camouflage beautifully in amongst the, uh, the bracken litter there on the floor. And uh, uh, a very well uh, camouflaged and, and uh, cryptic bird uh, that migrates all the way from sub-Saharan Africa uh, to spend the summers in the UK and the Western Europe and across Central Europe as well, uh, all the way across to sort of Northern China um, to breed. So let's get into some facts and figures about, about night jars. Well, where can you see them? Um, typically they breed on uh, our lowland heathlands. Um, so you would be looking at places like Chobham, um, Wisley and Ockham, Whitmore, um, Barossa and Ash Ranges, which are both military training areas, um, Thursley Common, Horsell Common is another place we can see them. So any of our lowland heathlands in and around this area, uh, you stand a really good chance of seeing night jars. The larger the heathland, the better. Um, but even on some of the smaller pockets like um, Smart's Heath, Prey Heath, Sheets Heath, uh, those small heathlands that Wokingborough Council manage in and around places like Purbright heading towards Old Woking. You stand a really good chance of seeing and hearing night jars uh, on those locations as well. Um, and they also like to nest in recently cleared coniferous plantations. So um, any Scots pine forestry that gets clear felled over the winter months, the following spring and potentially for a couple of years after it's been clear felled, that open ground with the leaf litter on it um, is also a, a, a favoured spot for the night jars to be, to be nesting. The European night jar is the only member of the night jar family that breeds in Britain and Ireland. So if you see or hear a bird that you think might be a night jar in the summer in the UK, it is only going to be the European night jar. Very, very, very occasionally we get vagrants that get blown over on a, a, a robust of wind. Um, but um, it's not something that uh, happens all that frequently. The birds will start arriving anytime from sort of late April, um, but more typically uh, they'll be arriving in sort of early May is the more standard time that they'll be arriving. And anytime from around about mid-July all the way through till early September at the latest is when the birds will start migrating back to sub-Saharan Africa. So if you want to still go out and try and hear night jars chewing, you've still got the opportunity to do it, although I would recommend going sooner rather than later because numbers will be, uh, numbers will be dwindling with every, with every week that goes by. So where, where do they breed? Where's the, where's the breeding territory of the European night jar? So on this map here, it's all the areas that are mapped in sort of this yellowy colour. Um, so obviously over here in the UK and, and Ireland, you can see that they breed in... Uh, the Brecks up in Norfolk, uh, a lot of the heathlands in the southeast of the UK, so Hampshire, uh, Berkshire, Surrey, uh, and then heading down to the southwest in places like uh, the Dorset Heaths, uh, patches of Wales, um, central England, and running up the east coast as well, slightly further north. Um, but you can see that the European night jars range is pretty, is pretty vast, so it covers all of pretty much the whole of um, Western Europe, apart from some of the really mountainous regions. Um, covering across through Poland, Belarus, Ukraine, Romania, a huge chunk of sort of southern Finland, um, western Russia, going all the way across to Mongolia, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, uh, Kyrgyzstan, down as far as Pakistan and Iraq, uh, across to Turkey, avoiding this mountainous region in the central area of Kazakhstan there. So they're a bird that's got a huge um, breeding territory. Uh, and we always think of them here in the UK as a, as a bird that's ours to some extent for half the year. 
but actually we share this 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 species as a breeding territory with a lot of birds across Europe uh, and stretching like say all the way across the sort of northern China Mongolia um, over in the east. And how do numbers look in the UK? Well, in Europe, we have a population of around about sort of 300, anywhere from 370,000 to 700,000 pairs of birds as a, as a sort of a ballpark estimate. The UK population, we have around three and a half to five and a half thousand pairs, which is around about 1% um, of the, uh, the European population. And I would envisage from doing nightjar surveys from the last, over the last 10 to 12 years that we're probably looking at Surrey having a population of around about one to 200 pairs on any given year, um, based on uh, how well they've migrated, what the weather conditions are like when they get here, the, the available food resource, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Surrey does, that sounds like a low number, but Surrey actually does really well in terms of supporting quite a significant number of, uh, of nightjar breeding pairs and we actually record the success or, or the perceived success of breeding by recording the number of cheering males because they were a bird that's active at dawn and dusk and, and through the night it's very difficult to spot when a bird is successfully on a nest or on a territory with a pair and they are successfully breeding so we use the marker for surveying as the number of cheering males uh, and that gives us an indication as to the, to the success the breeding success of those birds so it's a it's a slight finger in the air but it's about as accurate uh, as we could get it and in the uk the the nightjar is on the amber list because it's undergone this recent decline so you can see we, we didn't really have sufficient data through the 1800s early 1900s we could have enough data to show that the birds were declining but that was the first sort of period of time where we got a, a decent um level of data that gave us a degree of certainty that the, the trend of the birds were going in a certain direction. Then through the mid 1900s and late 1900s, that trend continued, which put the nightjar, the European nightjar in the UK as a breeding bird on the amber list. Um, and that was through things like loss of habitat. So we were doing things like planting up our heathlands during the post-war efforts with pine woodland to make the timber industry in the UK more um, self-sustaining. We were building houses and things on our heathlands because they were viewed as wastelands. Uh, and not doing that much for, for us as a, a, a species of humans. Um, and then conservation started to pick up on the fact that these birds weren't doing particularly well. Heathlands became much, much more protected. And in the late back end of the century, up into sort of the, uh, the early part of the 2000s, we've seen a contin generally continuing upward trend um, of nightjars. So they are now going in the right direction thanks to conservation efforts and a greater awareness from the general public of the um, sensitivities of these birds around disturbance and their requirements for breeding. But that period of, of successful growth hasn't yet offset the impact of these, these sort of, uh, you know, 100 years worth, if you like, of, uh, of populations in the UK go going in the wrong direction. So although they're going in the right direction now, they're still on the amber list, but at least we, it looks like we're starting to turn that ship around, which is a real positive. There's a lot of text on here, and I'm not really a fan of slides with just text on. I think this is the only one I've got with, with full text on it, but um, I, I'll talk you through it. So when it comes to feeding, night jars are a spectacular little bird, um, and there is nothing else in the UK, to my knowledge, that behaves or feeds anything like uh, uh, the nightjar. They feed primarily on insects, so predominantly moths and beetles, and, and uh, moths and beetles at the larger end of the scale rather than the smaller end, but they will take the smaller stuff if they get the chance. And that makes up the, the bulk of their diet, so large invertebrates which they, they catch on the wing. They tend to do most of their feeding at dawn and dusk, which is where the um, uh, description of crepuscular comes in, so animals that are active at dawn and dusk are known as crepuscular. They will be active through the night as well, um, which would obviously makes them nocturnal. Um, but we tend to think as the, of them as a crepuscular species because the bulk of their activity, uh, whether it's cheering, whether it's feeding, happens at, at dawn and dusk. For any of you who have seen night jars on the wing, um, and we'll see a little video clip later on, they, they look a bit like a falcon. They've got quite long, thin wings. They look like a, to some extent, maybe a hobby in flight or perhaps a cuckoo. Um, and those long thin wings, when you think about other bird species that have those long thin wings, they tend to be very, very agile uh, and very maneuverable flyers because they're prey items that are quite difficult to catch. 
So if you think of Swifts, Swallows, uh, House Martins, Sand Martins, Hobbies, these are all bird species who catch prey items that are very, very maneuverable. So they need to be very agile on the wing to be able to adapt to the uh, maneuvers that their prey items are trying to, to make to dodge being eaten, essentially. So uh, nightjars have this incredible maneuverability on the wing when, they, when they're hunting down uh, prey. And that ability to hunt pr uh, prey in an agile manner comes from this fly catching behavior, the second part of this second paragraph, where a bit like a fly catcher, I've seen stone chats do this. They'll sit out on a perch, they'll just watch for prey items flying past, they'll, they'll dart off the perch, grab the prey item, and then come back to their perch. In a very similar way to a fly catcher will we'll take uh, insects. Um, from the air and it's a bit of a lazy way really of catching your food let your food come to you you nip out grab it and you sit back on your perch and wait for more to come to you so you can't blame them having just flown all the way from Africa um, but they also have this other um, method of feeding which is known as trawling so this is a bit similar to I guess how a basking shark feeds when it's um, feeding on plankton in the oceans they have a huge gape as a night jar uh, and that's not only the um, the, the uh, north to south width that the, uh, the, they can open their, their, their beaks, their gape, but also the east to west, the left to right uh, width of their mouth. So they have this huge mouth that acts like a net and they'll fly around in the air with their mouths open, ready to catch prey, trawling a bit like a basking shark goes for plankton uh, and grabbing hold of prey items in, in flight because obviously it's dark, they've got very, very sensitive eyes um, but any opportunity they've got to um, improve their chances, then they'll take that. And there's another little adaptation that they've got, which is pretty unique, which we'll get to in a second. But speaking of their eyes, large eyes either side of the head, typical of any animal that's nocturnal, uh, because it allows the maximum amount of light to go in and then they can um, uh, have a better chance of catching their prey. But interestingly, their retina lacks um, cone cells. Now, cone cells in our eyes are what we need to essentially see in colour. Um, but because nightjars don't need to see in colour, they lack these cone cells. So they see the world in, in grayscale, if you like, in black and white. Um, and instead, they've got motion sensitive rods rather than colour rods in their eyes. So we have rods and cones, uh, rod cells and cone cells in our eyes. Um, and it's in the, the rod cells in our eyes that allow us to see in colour. Now, we need to do that because when we were foraging in the wild, we needed to know that, you know, red berries might be poisonous. So we would generally avoid red berries, for example. Um, night jars don't need to worry about that. They can handle all the prey items that they eat. So they have motion sensitive rods in their eyes instead, which helps them further adapt to the ability to catch these fast maneuvering prey items on the wing. But they also have a membrane layer behind the retina um, called the, um, now I don't know if this is tapetum or tapetum, um, but I prefer to say tapetum because it just sounds nicer when it rolls off the tongue. Um, so they have this tapetum and that reflects any light um, back to the retina, which has missed the rods. And that again gives extra sensitivity. So their eyes are not only just big to allow maximum amount of light to come in during the, um, during the low light levels at night, but they've got these extra uh, adaptations, which are these motion sensitive rods and the tapetum that further enhance their visual ability to be able to uh, hunt their prey items in the dead of night. And if you catch a night jar's eyes in a torch or something like that, you'll see that kind of cat's eye reflection that comes back from the eye, which um, re, uh, supports the um, uh, physiological features in the eye there. So this is a this is a night jar in the hand and you can see the size of the gape here. Uh, and we'll get to a video clip after this again that shows just shows just how, how wide these birds can open their mouths. It's a bit of a snapshot, blink and you'll miss it, but you'll see it. So as you can see, the gape is absolutely massive relative to the size of the bird and the size of their head. You can see the sort of the north south, uh, you know, the, the up and down um, uh, height to the gape is pretty significant. And also the width, the sort of the east to west um, gape is, is significant as well. You'll see you can probably just make out in the mouth there. They've got these slightly lighter little dots in the in the roof of their uh, mouth, which you, which you might be able to see. And they uh, are slightly rough areas. Uh, that mean that when they catch a prey item, let's say they catch a moth, um, which are, which are uh, uh, covered in um, wing, uh, scales on their wings and things, which makes them a bit difficult to grab hold of. This is a slightly rough area in the mouth that allows them to sort of grab hold of their prey and gives them a bit of grip, essentially, in the mouth to be able to keep hold of that prey item. But the, the incredible extra little bit of adaptation that they've got 
are these what I always refer to as whiskers, if you like, on, on either side of their upper uh, beak. And these are a bit like eyelashes. They're essentially the, um, the, 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 they're called bristles, but they're the feathers that don't have the barbs coming off them. So if you've ever had a feather in your hand and there's that central spine to the feather, it's that bit of the feather without the little feathery bits that have all the patterns coming off the sides. Now those bristles act as a bit of a safety net to help them to catch prey items. So you imagine you're a nightjar flying around at night trying to catch a moth. You've got these big eyes that help you try and see in the in the night to make the, the motion sensitivity fit, um, more enhanced than it would be otherwise with your um, uh, your cone cells, your motion sensitive cone cells. Um, but it's still a difficult job trying to catch a moth on the wing in the in the pitch black. So if they just miss their moth when they're trying to catch them, they've got these these bristles on either side of the upper uh, part of the beak here now. If you were to, and I've been lucky enough to hold the nightjar in the hand when we've ringed them, if you were to stroke the nightjar like you would a dog, I guess, sort of from the front of the beak running back over the top of the head past the eye and going that way like you would stroke a dog, then these bristles are a bit rigid and they don't really flex backwards very much. But if you stroke the nightjar, this is a ridiculous thing to say, but if you stroke the nightjar from the head running towards the beak, then those bristles do flex forwards quite a lot. So they're quite rigid going backwards, but they do flex forwards quite a lot. And that just helps with the fact that if they do catch a moth that flies in this way, hits these bristles, that it doesn't flex back, which gives the bird the chance to try and maneuver its mouth around to try and grab hold of that prey item. So it's a, it's another adaptation that they've got that allows them to successfully feed in the dead of night. So it's an incredible little, um, peculiar little bird, but there isn't, there isn't much else like it in the, well, there's nothing else like it in the UK. Across the world, there are lots of other species of nightjar, but not in the UK. Right, now you might have to bear with the buffering on this video slightly with our quite literally agricultural internet here at the farm. But this is a nightjar in the hand that's been caught from uh, ringing. And there will be a moment midway through the video uh, where the bird opens its mouth. So it do, they, they do have some peculiar movements in the hand as well. So any movements that look a bit strange, isn't the video buffering probably um it is the movement of the bird they're a bizarre little thing but watch midway through and the sound that the bird makes is it sounds like a drawer being opened a wooden drawer being opened and wood rubbing against wood but it's a bizarre sound but have a little listen to this you might need to turn your volume up slightly So those movements of the bird. And when the bird raises its head back, that's when you're right. Now here you'll see the gate and listen to this sound. Okay, does everyone get that? It's a bizarre little thing. There is nothing else like it. Very relaxed in the hand, having been rung. They'll take a few measurements, they'll ring it, and then they'll uh, they'll let it go about its business. Um, so it's a it's a bizarre little movement, and I hope that that flash of how wide the gape can open gives you a bit of an example as to uh, what that bird is able to do when it comes to uh, to feeding. Oh, it's going to play it again. Here we go. Right next, that is the next slide. Isn't it? Yeah. Now. Nightjars are one of three of our what we call SPA or special protection area breeding birds. So you'll know a lot of our heathlands are designated as um, sites of special scientific interest or triple SIs, places like Chobham Common at uh, NNRs, so National Nature Reserves, um, Conservation Love is an acronym. Um, they also are designated as SPAs or special protection areas, and that's for three species of ground nesting birds. Now, the nightjar is one of those three species. On the left here, we've got the Dartford warbler which is one of the other two species and on the right we've got the uh, we've got the woodlark and I just thought it was worth mentioning the sort of the holy trinity if you like of our heathland birds um, because uh, the three of them put together give sites this SPA designation uh, and that helps protect the site from um, development uh, encroaching too close to the area uh, to the SPA area so it's thanks to these two little guys plus the nightjar um, that these spaces are uh, are protected from development and any um, uh, urbanisation, I guess, is the best way of wording it. And when I say ground nesting, I, I mean this this picture demonstrates you know exactly what I mean by ground nesting. Night jars are probably 
and as far as I know anyway, they're probably the laziest nester I've ever seen when it comes to birds. Um, they fly all the way from sub-Saharan Africa, a journey of a few thousand miles, and they will quite literally pick a spot on the floor in amongst some old branches or leaf litter and go, yep, yeah, this'll do, this'll do. And that's the nest. They don't really pull together any twigs or anything like that. They don't blind it with feathers that much. They, they might collect a little bit of material to make it slightly, um, slightly warmer and cushioned for the eggs, but there's not a huge amount of effort goes in. They're nothing like a, uh, you know, a, a long tail tip, for example, that builds this incredibly intricate little cocoon of a nest made from spiders webs and lichens and uh, animal hair and things. There's no effort like that goes into it. They will pick a spot on the ground, go, this'll do. They'll lay a clutch of one, maybe two eggs. Very rare occasions you'll get three, but it's normally one or two. Um, they'll have one brood per year. Sometimes they'll have two if they get here early enough uh, and they are uh, able to take advantage of the conditions when, when they get here. So if we have, a, in inverted commas, a good summer for night jars um, with relatively, relatively warm, relatively dry and, and a long summer, let's say, they'll, they'll potentially get away two broods. And their average lifespan in the wild is around about four years and they start breeding at year one. So they only really get about three years to breed on average, um, which is why numbers can be impacted quite a lot. Because if they only have one brood and they only have one egg each time over three years, they're only a pair is only raising three um, young. So that's only a plus one gain each time. So it's important that the disturbance is minimized to these birds from things like dogs running through heather. Um, and also uh, that we keep to maintaining these habitats in good condition and protecting them so that they've got the opportunity to have good clutch sizes and as many broods as possible each year. But interestingly, the oldest ringing recovery was a, a bird that was just over 12 years old, which is a significant age for a bird of um, this size. Uh, but also it's a bird that's done that migration to sub-Saharan Africa and back 11 times in its, uh, sorry, 12 times in its lifetime or 11 and a half, maybe depending on. Uh, where the ringing recovery was uh, for its last recovery, ringing recovery. But that's a huge amount of mileage for a bird that's, uh, that is pretty small, a wingspan of sort of circa 30 centimetres, really. Um, that's a really long-lived bird, so, uh, so a hell of an innings there from that 12-year-old that uh, nightjar. And this is the bit that's the, the iconic bit, I guess, of a night jar. I've tried to pull out a few little facts and figures there around that, you know, the bristles on the beak, the, um, the rods and cones in the eyes, that are some little known facts about night jars, but this is the bit that is synonymous with the night jar. When you think of the night jar in the UK, it's the call, it's the cheering call that, uh, that you think of. Now, there is a night jar in this tree and I can't quite remember where it's perched, but it's somewhere up in the top right-hand corner here. And at the end of the video, you'll, you'll see it fly out of the tree and head off to the right hand side here. And you'll, I think you hear it either do a couple of cue calls, contact calls or some wing clapping. Um, and I'll talk about it in a minute, but let's just enjoy 30 seconds or so of a, a male night jar cheering. There he goes. So the bulk of the calls there were the cheer, and that is the male song, essentially. And like any other bird that sings, um, that song does, or the cheering sound is, 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 has two purposes. One is to let other males know, look, boys, I got here. This is my patch. If you want a nest, you can, but do it somewhere else because I've got this bit. But it's also uh, a call to attract the ladies as well and say, hey, ladies, listen to my cheer, you know, I reckon you should maybe consider coming out for a drink with me because this is, you know, this is something you don't want to miss out on. Um, so it's a twofold thing. One is it's slightly aggressive, like boys clear off. This is my patch. And one is it's slightly amorous. Hey ladies, look what you could get hold of here. So that's why they're cheering. And then that quick call that you heard when the bird took flight uh, is a contact call that they make. So if I 
go to the next slide, and I might have to click, where's my mouse, there he is. Do it again. So that QIT call uh, is a contact call. Now they only make that QIT call when they're flying and they only cheer when they're perched. So here we'll be able to see a male, uh, and this is incredible footage. Seeing a nightjar cheering in daylight and being able to record this is incredible. If you watch his beak, it will, it will almost blur where the beak is vibrating so fast, it just, it just blurs into sort of a gray pixelated, um, unclear uh, sort of image. And then it will stop cheering and the beak will become clear and we'll be able to see it in, in sharp focus again. Um, so when they're cheering, they're always perched. When they do the cuit call, that's a contact call to either chase off another male or to make contact with the female uh, that they've paired up with. But the, the text on the right there, the, these cheering calls um, can last several minutes. And I can, tr I can try and do an awful impression of a night jar here, so bear with me. But they, they have two phrases. One is a long drawn out note, and then there's a, there's a shorter phrase which is a slightly different pitch. And then they go back to the pitch they were on for a long drawn out note. So they kind of go. A bit like that. Hopefully you can hear that and I haven't embarrassed myself. Uh, and apologies, I'm on the Heath now. So any night jars that heard that, I'm apologies, apologizing for my awful impression of you. Um, but the thinking is, that that change in pitch is when the bird takes in, is, is actually still cheering, but is inhaling. Um, so they have a long drawn out exhale, then they inhale and continue to cheer, a quick in breath, and then they continue to exhale as they're cheering. Now for me, that makes sense because that would be, if I was a female nightjar, a demonstration of fitness. The longer a male can continue to cheer and inhale and exhale and continue to cheer, as a female would be a really good sign of fitness to me to say, look, this, this guy can cheer for seven or eight minutes nonstop. That's a fit little bird that I want to go and say hello to. Um, if they can only do it for two or three minutes, I'd be thinking, sorry, mate, you got to do better, maybe next year. And these phrases contain just shy of 2000 notes per minute. That's an incredible amount of notes per minute. And scientists have actually got the ability now to have software that can record the trill rate and the phrase length and by analyzing that, we can actually distinguish individual birds. So each night jar's chur is bespoke to that individual male. Um, so let's have a little look at this chap in daylight, cheering away on this, uh, on this branch here. So it's about a minute and a half. I might, I might cut it a fraction short because it's a minute and a half of the same thing, essentially. So here he goes. So you can see the beaks blurring there. That's him cheering. See how it's blurred? It looks like it's doing nothing. But that bird is emitting nearly 2,000 notes per minute. <laughs> it looks like I'm fobbing you off. It looks like it's doing nothing. But I guarantee you, that beak is moving so, so fast, you almost can't see it. There he goes. And look how much sharper the picture gets around the beak when he doesn't cheer. And this, this is classic. Look at it. The lying in line with the perch, that's typical of a night jar. They like to lie along the length of the, the, the limb. And he'll start cheering in a minute. There he goes. Teaser. Here we go. Oh, short little burst. This is one that the ladies probably wouldn't be interested in. Not trilling, not cheering for long enough. So there you go. That is footage that, I mean, I've, I've seen night jars cheering in good light when I've been out night jar surveying. Uh, but by good light, I mean, I'm talking about half nine, 20 to 10 at night, and it is it is twilight. Um, to see that in full daylight, I mean, what I'd give for that, that's incredible, absolutely incredible. So, now this is this is the night jar in flight. They fly, they've got a very, very soft um, wing flap, uh, and it looks very 
energy efficient. They take a flap and it's like it can sort of just um, uh, do a lot of the work for them in not much effort. But you'll hear some of the Qwit contact calls here. And this is over in Berkshire. This is our friends. At... So here's the night draft perched in the tree, just by there. And here's the contact calls when they fly. There you go. So those QIT contact calls are the contact calls when they're in flight. And thank you to our friends over at Barks Bucks in Oxfordshire Wildlife Trust for letting me, um, they don't know I've stolen that off YouTube, but I'm sure they don't mind. Uh, and they also get, they have sexual dimorphism between the males and the females. So apart, so apart from the sexual organs obviously being different in the males and the females, there are, there are other visible and physical differences between the males and the females. So the females on the right here, and like a lot of bird species, the female is, people describe it as often a bit more drab and they are a bit less colorful sometimes, but there is, there is an incredibly smart purpose for that. And that's because most of the time it's the female bird that spends more time on the nest. So she's in a very, very vulnerable position there. She's on the ground, she's at the risk of predation from potentially other birds of prey, foxes, badgers. Um, uh, the, the chicks are at risk of things being eaten by things like stoats, weasels, uh, grass snakes, adders, rats. There's all sorts of stuff that would, that would happily um, munch on a nightjar chick if it came across them. So she needs to lay still in full daylight and rely on her camouflage. And that's why the females are, some say it drab, I say it incredibly well marked with these cryptic markings to keep them as well camouflaged as they are to protect their young when they're on the nest. The male equally is pretty well cryptically marked because he needs to hide in the daytime as well. But when you see them in flight, they have these obvious wing spots. So these white wing spots at the top of each wing there on the three primary feathers and in the corners of the tail feathers here as well. And the males will use these to flash at other males and also to females. And again, like the cheer, it's a warning to the males and it's a bit of an invitation to the females as a bit of a flash to say, look, I'm a boy, this is my patch. If you're a male, clear off. But if you're a lady, you're more than welcome. So it's, a, it's another obvious difference. And people, there's, there's old wives' tales, I guess, of people going out with hankies and flashing white hankies when they do a night jail walk to try and get males to come in and get a bit closer. They're a very inquisitive bird. I've tried flapping a hanky and it sometimes I have got no scientific um, conclusion as to whether flapping a hanky draws in a male or not. They tend to be just quite inquisitive. And if you're out there, they'll come and have a look, see what you are, and then they'll clear off whether you have a hanky or not. And just finally, the last slide is a bit of a, a, a interesting tale as to why the nightjar has its Latin name. So the nightjar's Latin name is Caprimulgus europaeus. Europaeus is the European bit for European nightjar, but Caprimulgus, if we break that word down into two parts, we've got the Capri bit, which means goat, the same as Capricorn on the star sign on the Latin, and Malego in Latin is to milk, so um, it's a, a to milk a goat, essentially, uh, is the first part, the Caprimulgus part of their um, Latin name, and in old folklore, people would often see nightjars in and around their livestock when they were out with their goats or whatever it might be out on the heaths or in areas where nightjars were nesting. And as they were moving around with their goats, they would see nightjars very often in the evening when they were going out with their goats to bring them back into a, to a holding area to keep them safe at night, back when we had wolves and what have you running around the countryside. Um, and people used to think that the nightjars were turning up to steal the milk from the goats and actually drink the milk of the goats or any other um, animals, the sheep or the cattle that, that, that were lactating. And you can actually see in this image here, I'm not quite sure what the snakes are doing here and they look like corn snakes. So I'm not quite sure where the origin of this picture is. But you can see there's a night jar here flying around. You've got one on the ground here. You've got another bird here flying around. You've got one actually on the back of a goat here. But it's this chap down here that's particularly interesting. So you can see the goats are here and the teat coming down. And they've actually drawn in a nightjar trying to try and take milk from the teat of the goat. Now, nightjars don't do this. They do not steal milk from any livestock whatsoever. But what was, what was actually happening was as shepherds were going out with their animals and they were finding them to bring them in at night, the action of the livestock moving through the undergrowth would disturb a lot of invertebrates and put them up in the air. And that meant the nightjars associated with the action of the herdsmen coming out with the animals 
with a with a buffet essentially so those birds would like to see the goats moving through the undergrowth because they just fly around they pick off all these invertebrates nice and easy um, and then they get a, a good uh, a good breakfast essentially for them around half nine ten o'clock at night before they have to go about their business either breeding or holding down their territory or uh, or continuing to feed or feed their young so the caprimulgus name is stuck uh, thanks to ancient folklore, but they do not drink the, the milk of goats. They very much feed on large invertebrates. And the final image there is just a, a picture of a nightjar um, taking some water. They get the bulk of their water from their insect diet, but I think that is an incredible image. Again, shows the, um, the size of the gape there, uh, which I'm hoping is uh, all your jaws on the floor now as you're uh, aghast with information from from night jars. So that is a whistle stop tour of night jars. Thank you ever so much for, uh, for, for listening. Happily take any questions. I could have gone on for hours about this, but I won't. I will restrain myself, stop there and I'll take any questions. Thank you so much, James. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I'm glad that my camera was off because you probably would have giggled at my facial expressions. My jaw was on the floor most of the time. Um, wonderful. We have a few questions coming in um, via the chat function. Um, and now is your opportunity, if you would like to, uh, to turn your cameras on and we can have that sort of two way conversation um, and ask lots of questions of James because he knows an awful lot about <laughs> night jars. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, I'm going to start off while everyone's sort of turning cameras on and thinking of their questions. We've had a couple of questions via the chat sort of early on in your presentation, James. Um, someone asked, uh, please, can you clarify the meaning of cryptic family? Um, oh, so that's question. so that's just to do with the, the, the markings of the bird um, are quite cryptic, cryptic, which allows them to be very well camouflaged when they're um, when they're nesting on the ground. Brilliant. That clears that up or not. Um, wonderful. And someone asked the um, origin uh, of the word churring. Uh, that's a good one because I've uh, in, in researching nightjar walks over the years I've tried to look into this um some people some people have called it um in the past the, the so it's cheering is to do with the essentially a a, 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 a a word description of the actual sound that's being made so um a bit like when you if you pop a balloon and I say what does a pop sound sound like the word pop sounds like the sound, hence the description. And cheering is the same, the word churring, and if you extend the er bit, the churring, is meant to be a, a word that accurately describes the sound in, in word form. Um, I've heard it in the past be described as purring, which I think is also um, quite, uh, quite apt. Um, so the churring bit is, as I say, just a, a word description of the sound. There's probably a word for that kind of a word that describes a sound in word form, but I'm not sure what it is. Someone here might know. Brilliant. Thank you, James. Is that, uh, did oh, David just say onomatopoeic? Is that is that what it is? Yeah. Uh, yes. See, I knew someone here would know. <laughs> Fabulous. Um, and uh, sorry, we've got questions coming in thick and fast now, which is wonderful. Um, uh, you were mentioning about um, the uh, sort of special protection areas and someone said size versus other SPAs question mark. Does that uh, make sense? So I'm presuming, <coughs> excuse me, I'm presuming that might be in relation to the size of the site relative to, I guess, how big it needs to be to potentially hold a pair of night jars, perhaps. Um, so there was a report that came out a few years ago about the, the state of nature in the UK. And it was written by a guy called Professor Lawton. Um, and he summed up his um, summary of the state of nature and what we need to do to improve conditions for nature and biodiversity in the UK with we need to make spaces <clears throat> bigger, better quality, more of them and make them more joined up to each other. And those four principles apply to any birds that are wanting to, to, to nest there anywhere. The bigger the space, the better, because we can get more of those individuals of that species in a space. And the more of them we can get in there, um, the more uh, genetic diversity we're throwing into the pool essentially. And that's obviously better for the species. Um, if you locked four people in a room and said, live there for five years, genetically you would run into problems, or 50 years, you genetically you'd run into problems. 
if you locked 500 people in a much bigger room and said live there for 50 years genetically you'd have far less problems so um so that's why bigger is better um and also the bigger these spaces the um the more buffering it gives so if for example a site were to uh, succumb to a wildfire or if it was very popular with people visiting and dog walkers and things then there's probably more likely to be areas that remain quieter so they get the birds undergo less disturbance um but i have seen night jars uh cheering and breeding on on pretty small sites so pretty small clearings within pine plantations that have been cleared so you know, you're probably looking at an area the size of maybe, oh, I don't know, four tennis courts, something like that, um, wow. as a little sort of clearing as an estimate. So they will take up little spaces if they get the chance, um, but the bigger, the better. Wow, brilliant. Um, and actually, that's a sort of perfect segue into the next question, which was, um, obviously, the report came out and about connecting nature. It's what what we are doing it's what we're trying to do now is sort of connect up those sort of spaces um someone has asked about the impact of reduction in, um in insects for the outlook of night jars from your personal sort of perspective so sort of when you've been sort of monitoring them and um the, facing the decline in insects how do you see it going at the moment are we in a sort of worrying state or we're so from, from monitoring night jars with a load of other people in Surrey um, over the last, I mean, I've been out surveying night jars now for, for, I don't know, 12, 13 years, something like that in Surrey. Um, and yes, night jar numbers at the moment are, are still pretty good. We're not seeing any significant declines associated with the decline in insect populations yet. But the yet bit is key because we do know insect populations are struggling. Um, or are some of them are, or a lot of them are certainly going in the wrong direction. Now, we're not seeing the fallout of that quite yet in terms of an impact uh, or a knock on effect on the success or otherwise of our breeding night jars. And some of that is because um, where we've got these heathlands and what have you, the insect populations on our heathlands, generally speaking, are doing OK. But I say OK because that's a sort of best case scenario. So they still have plenty of food and anyone who's ever gone out in a night jar or walk with me knows that in terms of insects, if there's midges around, then they'll find me because um, I'm an absolute buffet uh, when it comes to midges. So um, we haven't seen an impact yet on night jar numbers with regards to insect populations. However, we are very aware of the fact that insect populations are going in the wrong direction uh, and monitoring that knock-on effect is something that we're all keeping an eye on because what we'd like to see is insect populations start to go in a good direction before we see any impacts on things like night jars um, breeding because very often by the time you get to that point you start to wonder well crikey are we are we too late to the party now has the, has the ball gained enough momentum to, or too much momentum for us to stop it rolling down the hill now so at the moment they're fine but it is something we're aware of Brilliant. Thank you, James. Um, right. Um, here we go. We've got a few more questions. Sorry, chat's gone a little bit mad, which is wonderful. Um, so, oh, great question. How long is the flight to Africa? And is it the same habitat? Bernie, that's a great question. And I'm desperate to get a speaker um, that can tell us about that habitat as well. Uh, I think it'd be really fascinating. But James, do you know anything? I mean, I'll, I'll happily fly over to Africa for a couple of weeks just to see what the habitat's like and firsthand. I mean, there's, you might as well get the picture at both ends. It's fine. Absolutely. Um, so I'm, I might genuinely push for that, actually. Uh, <laughs> it's not going to happen, but it's fine. Um, so how long is the journey? So the journey takes uh, a, probably six six to eight weeks um and there's a slight hesitancy in my voice it could, I, I guess you could probably say four to eight weeks as a ballpark because it will depend on the amount of food that they're able to find when they're traveling because obviously it's a lot of energy expenditure they need to feed up as they go en route um a bit like when you go on a long car journey if you don't have enough snacks you end up stopping at service stations more uh, and no one wants to do that so um they need to feed up and rest up along the way. 
they're also fighting either with or against the weather conditions. So if the wind is blowing from north to south and they're trying to move north, that will slow down their journey. So they'll sit tight in a particular location for a slightly longer period and just wait for the wind to change, either for it to be um, still or ideally a, a wind coming from the south, because obviously that would um, that would act a bit like when you go to the airport and you stand on those travelators and you're walking, you're putting in the same effort as someone who's not on a travelator, but you are moving at a much faster speed. Um, so ideally, if they have favourable winds and they're able to get good food along the way um, and rest up when needed, then they could do it in a relatively short space of time, sort of circa four weeks, I guess. But if they're fighting against the wind, if food is difficult to come by, um, it could take anything up to, I guess, a couple of months, um, which is why the birds might just be a bit late arriving in sort of mid-May, perhaps. Um, and then the habitat where they are, they, it's, it's in and around... Um, Sub-Saharan Africa. So, you know, you're talking in and around the tropics. Uh, so you're looking at, um, how do you describe it? Pretty lush grasslands, I guess. Um, woodland ed edges, but we're looking at sort of rainforest edges, really, when, when we're getting down that neck of the woods. Uh, rich with invertebrates. Um, and ideally, they're catching, uh, let's have a think, they'd be going in our winter but they don't really have the seasons down there. So they'd be getting, you know, the wet conditions that they need to allow the vegetation to grow, which allows the invertebrates to feed on the vegetation. And then they've got lots of invertebrates to feed on. So um, four to eight weeks ish for the journey, depending on what the weather and the food situation is. And um, yeah, typical habitats that you would find in and around the equator, really lush with vegetation and invertebrates. Well, we've had quite a few volunteers to, um, go to africa and volunteer <laughs> let's all go here we go we can find, we'll have a volunteer trip to africa there we go i can see oh it. my goodness absolutely a work party in the congo or something. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful um on that question actually someone asked um do they travel the same routes do we know that yeah so the bto thanks to the wonders of science now we used to rely on ringing recoveries um but ringing recoveries would only allow you to figure out where the bird was ringed and where it had been retrapped and you were, you were kind of um, trying to piece together bits of the puzzle with lots of the bits of the puzzle missing. Um, so we always got an incomplete picture. It was giving us information that was, that was leading us down a certain route, but we couldn't be conclusive. But now I think lots of people on here might have seen on the British Trust for Ornithology's website, they put little GPS trackers on cuckoos. They've done the same thing with night jars. And broadly speaking, the nightjars follow a very, very similar route to the um, cuckoos. Interestingly, individuals seem to have their, their preferred routes. So some will, let's say, migrate from Africa and hug the west coast of Africa and then come up into the Europe in um, places like Spain and Portugal and then very much hug sort of the western side of Europe when they get here. And then some birds will migrate down through um, sort of uh, Italy and then jump over the sort of, I guess, the central bit of Africa there and kind of go time it to get a quick trip over the Sahara uh, and then end up in the central or slightly eastern part of Africa. So it's a bit like a circle. Uh, they kind of go up the west and down through the, the centre or slightly east and then move their way back round. There are some birds that just go up and down the Italy route. There are some birds that just go up and down the Western Africa route. Um, <clears throat> and even though they may have a preference on their, their preferred route, they will respond based on um, the situation that's presented to them. So if the wind is favourable, but it's blowing slightly to the east, then they will naturally just be carried off slightly to the east and take that route because it's less energy expenditure. So... They do have a preferred route, but they're also a bit sensible with their energy expenditure and they'll pick and choose whatever is to their advantage in that moment. But if right. you jump on the British Trust for Ornithology's website, you can you can see these routes and you can actually track the birds. Fabulous. Um, right, the questions have gone slightly berserk, actually. With obviously, a lot of interest in um, uh, night jars. So forgive me if I don't see um, your question. I'm just trying to scroll through and every time someone adds a new question it sort of jumps so I lose my place it's uh, not the easiest uh, to see um, but I can see a great question from Bernie um, uh, on a similar subject do males arrive first or do male and female come to the UK together it's a great question it is the males do tend to arrive fractionally before the females but there's there's not much in it we're splitting hairs really 
Um, the males probably at most are, a, I don't know, a week or so ahead of the females. Um, but that's, that's a very rough um, guesstimate. The, the males certainly when they get here are, are the more active birds because they want to pick their territories, get it nailed down. So when the ladies do turn up, um, they have a uh, presentable abode to uh, try and woo them with. But um, the males are fractionally ahead of the females. But like I said, there's not much in it, if anything, most years. Brilliant. Um, a great question from John. What do they do during a torrential downpour? Do they just sit it out or seek shelter? That's a great question. Uh, they sit it out is the short answer. Um, they don't really hunker under a bush or a tree or anything like that. The male, in typical male fashion, might might abandon the nest and go and perch somewhere in a, you know, a, a heavily leaved tree or something like that and just leave the female to ride it out. Um, but uh, yeah, in essence, they rely on their camouflage uh, and they will still just sit tight on the ground, let their, let their uh, sort of external feathers do the work in terms of keeping the worst of the elements out. Uh, because again, when they're back down in um, sub-Saharan Africa, in and around the equator and stuff, um, you know, there they will typically face heavy downpours on an almost daily basis, potentially, depending on where they are. Um, as the, the the weather warms up during the day, and then you get those afternoon downpours where the the weather systems just release all that energy. Um, so they're not uh, they're not unused to our our British summers. Let's put it that. <laughs> And thank goodness for that. <laughs> I don't think we're used to them at the moment either. Um, uh, right. So next question is, uh, do night chars chirp when they are on the ground or just when they're perched? Brilliant. That is good. They, it, 99 times out of 100, it's when they're perched. Um, and the perch doesn't necessarily have to be that high. Um, I have seen them right in the top of, you know, 20, 30 metre tall trees. Uh, but equally, I've seen them a metre off the ground in a, in a relatively low branch um, that just gets them off the deck a little bit. They will cheer on the ground if they're being particularly lazy in the same way that sometimes kestrels don't hover. They will just perch in a tree and just watch to see uh, if there's any prey around. So, um, you know, like all animals of which humans are one, if there is a slightly more energy efficient slash lazy option to take, they will take it. Um, but by perching on the ground... Uh, the, the, the downside to perching on the ground is, yes, you're saving energy, but the chur doesn't travel as far because you're down in amongst a load of vegetation. So the chur doesn't travel very well. So if you are a strong, fit male that wants to um, vocalize to as many ladies as possible, you want to get up on a perch, be confident and go, ladies, listen to how loud this is. Bang, off they go cheering. If you hunker down on the ground, yes, you're saving yourself energy, but you you, you, you know, you're not casting your net that wide. So that's why they like to get up on a perch more often than not. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, right. Uh, we've got a couple of questions that kind of go together, actually. So I'll ask them at the same time. One's from Beverly and the next one is from Julia. Um, do we know um, how many pairs there are on Ockham Common? And Julia's question is, where in the UK is the biggest population of night jars? Oh, right. I'll deal with the second one first, because the answer is I don't know. Um, I would have thought. And it depends what you call. So if you're looking at it as a, as a site, let's say it depends what is classed as a site, because I guess you could call something like the New Forest a site. And if you did that, you would probably say places like the New Forest are uh, some of the biggest populations. Um However, if you went on something being a site, as in Wisley and Ockham or Chobham or what have you, then you're looking at places like Arne down in Dorset is probably one of the biggest ones. Chobham as a National Nature Reserve. Um, National Nature Reserve designation is there because it is um, given that title because it is one of, if not the best examples of that habitat type in the country. So Chobham National Nature Reserve is one of the best examples of lowland heathland throughout the United Kingdom. <clears throat> excuse me and uh chobham ash ranges purbright they probably in the southeast of england are three of the biggest populations that you're going to get in terms of cheering night jars uh, i mean ash ranges <coughs> excuse me um can have 
50 or 60 cheering males in a good year uh, just on ash ranges alone so yeah. ash is a significant population um and then how many uh, pairs do we have on ockham um i've done the survey this year because i actually live on site and ockham i think this year has uh, at least seven cheering males so that's the 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 the, the measuring tool that we use to estimate the number of pairs now that doesn't necessarily mean all seven of those males have um successfully paired up and raised young but that is the the marker we use to um record the success or otherwise of the species so seven cheering males on the Ockham side which is really really good because over the last 12 to 18 months with lockdowns and things Ockham underwent a heck of a lot of footfall and visitor pressure there's a lot of dog walking activity out there um, and we were all a bit concerned about the impact that would have with regards to disturbance on these birds because the night jars only need to be disturbed off their nest once or twice and they might give up on it. Um, so that's why we're, we're really uh, clear when it comes to communicating with the public, please keep dogs under control and the risk of wildfires and stuff like that because it can have a serious impact. So yeah, six or seven cheering males on Ockham and the best populations like I say, it depends what you call a site, but the new forest is obviously massive and can do it. But in the southeast of England, um, Ash Ranges, Chobham and um, Herbert Ranges are probably three of the best in the country. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, right. We have another question here. Lots of questions coming in. Um, I'm going to have to call it a day at some point. I think <laughs> James won't be able to as much as he might like to. <laughs> I have a meeting at 12, but you know, apart from that. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right. Uh, great question from Bill. It's the size of their gape due to the size of the flutterbys in sub-Sahara Africa. Great question. I love that thought. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, I mean, it definitely helps. I mean, it's part of it, it's part of the size of the gape is the bigger the gape, the more chance they've got of catching a prey item when they attempt to catch it. But obviously, the downside of that is, uh, if you imagine you're doing that flying around, trawling with your mouth open, the bigger your gape, the harder you have to work because of wind resistance to physically move that thing around. So there is a balance between a big gape and the energy expenditure required to use that gape versus a big gape catching more prey items essentially they like all animals the bigger the meal they can get the better because they don't know when their next meal is coming so if you get the opportunity to catch let's say a hawk moth um then you'll take it because that's a substantial meal whereas if you're catching micro moths all night uh you know you're having to work pretty damn hard to get a good meal that night um so uh yes it's not only to do with the size of the prey items in and around the equator um because the invertebrate diversity down there will be will be you know 10 20 100 times more diverse than what we get here in the uk um but uh it's more to do with the ability to catch bigger prey items more frequently i think uh and also just catch prey items more frequently it increases their odds of success but it's a balance between energy expenditure to to manoeuvre that big old mouth around through the air. <laughs> it certainly is huge. Um, all right, David has asked a question. Um, do pairs stick together each year or do ma males play the field? Again, good question. And it's something I don't know the answer to, but I've always been intrigued by. Um, and I would need to look to see whether there's any studies into this, whether, they are, whether they're faithful or not. Um, you tend to find... I'm thinking, I'm thinking in areas where there's not many birds. So, so on the Wisley side of Wisley and Ockham, you tend to find that you get roughly, because there's anywhere between two and four cheering males, excuse me, males on the Wisley side of Wisley and Ockham, you tend to find that the birds stick, the, the, the cheering males anyway, stick to similar areas. Now, whether that's the same bird or not, I don't know. But there's, there's, a, there's a block of heathland in front of the farm where I am now, and that only ever gets one cheering male on it. I've never heard two. Now, even when the habitat, in my opinion, would have been good enough to support two, and on that, that size area, I would, wouldn't be surprised if I heard two cheering males. I think it's big enough to accommodate two. Um, I've only ever heard one. Uh, now, whether they're pairing up with the same females or not, I don't know. And the reason why I was, there's a degree of hesitancy in my voice here is because migratory birds will still, there are examples of birds that will, even though they migrate, they will um, still pair up with the same female year after year. Um, so 
my honest answer is I'm not 100% sure, but more than happy to look into it. But I think David, if you ask the question, also has a raised hand. Yes, I do. I, I, I just wondered, um, rather like bat watching, where, where you have a, a, a technique of <coughs> a, a machine that could detect which bat is which, if you like, and you said that each individual night show had a, a, a different song, whether there would be any merit in, in recording them and trying to find out which bird was which. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I've never done it. And I, I must admit, until I researched this um, coffee morning in the 13 odd years I've been surveying night jars, I didn't know that there was the technology that is that now exists. Maybe it's relatively recent, uh, which allows you to distinguish one bird's chair from another individual bird's chair. Um, but that is definitely uh, something some of you guys might know, Mike Wake, that does a lot of our research and policy work. And um, that's something that I might be gently pushing his way to see if he wants to, um, it, it will get his synapses firing, that's for sure. Uh, and he will go off and figure out whether there's some university out there that is interested in doing some sort of thesis or PhD on one of our reserves on uh, on studying that if it hasn't been done before, because it'd be a really interesting piece of work. But because they're a nocturnal bird, because they're so cryptic, and because they're so difficult to, to spot um, anyway, whether it's day or night time, uh, that probably leans towards why I don't know the answer to the question because it's not an easy puzzle to solve. No, but there is a lot of technology out there now that would allow us to, to, you know, probably answer that question better now than ever before. Thank you. That would be so exciting. Great question. Um, yeah, how can we get Mike to do it? <laughs> <laughs> Give him the technique. To yeah, he'll technology. find a way. Absolutely. Could on recordings, couldn't you? It, it, some of these guys with radar bulbs and so on can record very good mm. images of, of, of sound and then they could be analysed. Yeah. Possibly. Yeah. yeah, there's definitely ways of doing it. Brilliant. Something to look forward to. Um, I think we're going to have to schedule a lot more talks on night jars next year, James. <laughs> 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 and walks. Um, right. Um, Bernie said, he's uh, thank you for our, uh, the great presentation, uh, great session. Um, Janice has asked, do they return to the same territory each year uh, or where they were born? Um, again, not 100% sure. Kind of, I partially answered that, I guess, before in my, in my response. And I say on Wisley out in front of the farm, I only have here one cheering male there. But I don't know whether it's the same bird coming back or whether that's just a space that the night jars look at and go, once one's got in there, it's, it's a one bird territory. Um, so the answer is, again, I'm, I'm not 100% sure, but what with the research that I'm going to send Mike's way, uh, hopefully within a couple of years and a PhD later, there'll be there'll be an answer to that question. Brilliant. Um, uh, one of our guests, Elizabeth, has said, uh, for listening to Night Jar, she's found Chopham Common better than Wisley. Ah, yes. No. Yeah, I'm with you. My amazing experience was at Chopham as well. That, I'll never forget that. It's just incredible. Um, I think that is it for questions oh my goodness so if anyone has a question that they would like to ask very quickly or they'd like to raise their hand and ask it in person uh you are more than welcome oh, just two more messages coming in um just bill saying thank you uh everyone fascinating and informative um and yes please more walks next year yes I've got, i'm going to publicly out james now because he volunteered a couple of weeks he's so, so busy taking over in his new role and doing an amazing amazing job um and he said i love night jar walks um if you'd like me to do more i'm quite happy he's really going to regret that <laughs> no I, I i won't at all because i, I mean obviously I'm, I'm completely biased because um in my 12 or 13 years with the wildlife trust i've um i've spent the first half of that managing lowland heath so i'm completely biased i'm a heathland man Chalk grasslands and woodlands and what have you are great. And uh, I love them to bits as well, but top of the list are heathlands for me. Um, and because, because we only get one nightjar species here in the UK and there is nothing else like it. And it is this, it's this weird, peculiar, bizarre little thing that, you know, it cheers at night, nothing else cheers. It's got these bristles on its beak. When you get it in the hand, it makes this frog croaky kind of sound they nest on the ground they don't even bother making a nest you know these rods and cones in their eyes you know they, they, 
there's nothing else in the UK like it. And I, I am completely biased towards the nightjar, but they are without a doubt a bird that has a special place in my heart. And um, if, if there is, if there's one bird that I think can get people really engaged with wildlife here in the UK, one of my pet hates is when people go, oh, British wildlife's boring, you know, you have to go to Africa or, you know, to see lions and tigers or go to India or something, you know, see tigers in, go to Australia because they've got the marsupials and stuff. Absolute nonsense in my book. The UK gets some incredible wildlife and night jars for me are one of those species that we can put on that pedestal and go, look at this thing. This is, this is bonkers, this bird. It's absolutely bonkers, but it's brilliant because it does this and it does this and it does this. So um, yeah, more than happy to take as many people out as want to do it for, for a night jar walk because it's something that everyone should, should if they have the opportunity to experience it, it is, a, is an absolutely magical and amazing, amazing thing. Brilliant. You all heard it. It's been recorded as well. There's no getting back from that statement. Absolutely fine. Absolutely fine. <laughs> so um, you heard it here. There will be more night jar walks, which is really exciting. Um, wonderful. Um, we don't have any more questions on the chat. If anyone would like to um, build. Yeah, I'll see you there. Absolutely. <laughs> um, uh, if anyone would like to um, ask a question now, feel free to wave at your hand, uh, wave your hands at the screen, or use the virtual raise hand button. I see no one. It is that silence that you feel when you're sort of waiting for that churring at night, isn't it? <laughs> whilst hitting your face to get rid of the midges or something. Yes. If anyone has um, not seen it, James did um, a Facebook Live video on, um, was it Ockham? Come on, I can't uh, remember. Yeah, uh, the Wisley side of Wisley and Ockham. Yeah. Brilliant, yes. And uh, first time um, the Trust had done a sort of Facebook Live like this, and James was absolutely bitten to death by midges um, and continued for over an hour doing a Facebook live walk um, and you must watch it. If you can find it on our Facebook um, or email us and we'll send you a link to it. It's just, it's like you're on the walk with him. It is so incredible. Um, his enthusiasm really comes across and you can hear the churring and you can see the night jars sort of swooping and hear wing claps. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, so I'd recommend um, having a look on Facebook for uh, that recording. Um, wonderful. Um, I have no more questions. So with that, I'm going to say thank you all so much for attending today. Um, if you want to do any more activities um, to do with Heath Week, uh, go to the Thames Basin Heath website or our website and search for Heath Week. Um, Thames Basin Heath, our partners are doing lots of fantastic drop-in events, so you can speak to them about night jars or Heathland um, and uh, learn lots of stuff. Um, so um, thank you very much for coming again and um, I look forward to seeing you at future talks. Thanks everyone, everyone. stay safe, take care of yourselves. <laughs>